uh, <laughs> my commute should be about seven minutes door to door. So really? 45 was a little bit. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. This episode is sponsored by Thing. The Seattle Theater Group and Sasquatch Festival founder Adam Zacks present Thing. From August 26th through the 28th at Historic Fort Warden in Port Townsend, you can enjoy a vast musical lineup, including Jungle, Modest Mouse, Father John Misty, and many more. The Thing Festival features two primary stages overlooking the Puget Sound, not to mention a variety of camping and parking accommodations. You can either book a one-day or three-day pass, and kids 12 and under are free, making this an event for the whole family. Come enjoy live music, art, and beautiful Fort Warden with us. To find out all the details, visit thingnw.org. This episode is sponsored by Thing. The Seattle Theater Group and Sasquatch Festival founder Adam Zacks present Thing. From August 26th through the 28th, at Historic Fort Warden in Port Townsend, you can enjoy a vast musical lineup, including Jungle, Modest Mouse, Father John Misty, and many more. The Thing Festival features two primary stages overlooking the Puget Sound, not to mention a variety of camping and parking accommodations. You can book either a one-day or three-day pass, and kids 12 and under are free, making this an event for the whole family. Come enjoy live music, art, and beautiful Fort Warden with us. To find out all the details, visit thingnw.org. All right, welcome back to this episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast. Um, my guest today is Mara Hardman. Mara, you, before we quote unquote went live, you said I could ask you anything. So we're going to start off with a question you've never been asked on an interview. How was traffic today? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> It was uh, perfectly Seattle traffic, perfectly quintessential, Seattle traffic. quintessential Seattle traffic. It was <laughs> rainy. Um, I didn't get the bridge on the way, so I will say that, but I did get a train that sort of stopped things up for a while. Nice. And yeah, traffic is back in, in full force. So how long did it take you to get from, from home to the office today? It took me about 45 minutes. Well, that's not terrible, but you only live three blocks away. Uh, I, my commute should be about seven minutes door to door. So really? 45 was a little bit. Oh my much. gosh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. All right. When there's no traffic, I'm seven minutes door to door. Wow. So it was pretty intense, but oh, okay. I made it. All right. So Mara, in all seriousness now, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about your personal backstory before we start talking about Seattle Cider? So how did you end up at Seattle Cider? What's, what's your life up till Seattle Cider? Oh yeah, that's a that's a broad question, but yeah. I love it. Um, so I've been here about five years. Um, prior to that, um, my career journey has been kind of random. I um, have a degree in psychology and sociology, and then I joined the Peace Corps. Okay. Um, I lived in Ukraine for two years, which is where I met my now husband. Okay. We moved back to Arizona for a hot minute. Um, in a time where it was really difficult to get jobs. So I, you know, worked in, um, worked as a server, got back into the industry. And after that, we moved to Seattle. I worked in the nonprofit world for a number of years. Um, I was coordinating events. That's also how I got into marketing. Uh, we, at the time, had to um, do some layoffs. My job stayed, but the marketer at the nonprofit that I was at, um, unfortunately, they had to cut the position, but not the work. And so we all sort of absorbed the marketing work, and that's where I learned to love that. Okay. Um, later, a friend of mine who I had worked with at the nonprofit um, sort of became my unofficial, uh, I have a, like a board of directors. Right. I call, I have a board of directors of friends that I'm like, okay, career moves. What are we talking about here? Uh, <laughs> who had moved on to, um, work at a grocery store as their, you know, part of their marketing team. And she's like, you know, this job is really weird and you'd love it. Right. Which is like, um, an awesome thing to hear. Cause I'm a little bit weird and I thought it would be kind of cool. So I worked in grocery for six years, um, doing marketing. What, if you don't and mind then, me interrupting you, what, what chain? Uh, I worked for whole foods market. Okay. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in the natural foods realm, um, it's actually how I first heard about Seattle Cider because we sold their products okay. and um, we would, you know, be part of events like Seattle Cider Summit. And so I would go and work those events. I'd also attended that mm -hmm. um, prior to um, working in the cider realm. And this same friend of mine um, messaged me one day after, I, you know, I'd been there for about six years and she'd already moved on to another position. And she said, listen, I know you're not looking for a job right now, but I happened to see this position open up and I think that you'd regret it if you didn't apply. So I applied and now I work in beer and cider. Um, so that was not something that was really ever on my radar. Okay. I considered myself more of like a hobbyist craft drinker. Okay. And so getting to do that for a living, my job is to talk about beer and cider. I could think of worse things to do on a daily basis. Yeah. It's not bad. No, not I like bad. it a lot. Not yeah, bad. There's a reason I've been here for five years. So you mentioned uh, you and your husband moved, you said back to Arizona for a hot minute, which I was going to laugh isn't, you know, in Arizona every minute hot, but did you grow up <laughs> in is. Arizona? I did okay. born and raised. Yeah. Born and raised. I all the way through college. I'm a, uh, NAU lumberjack alumni. Okay. And Do then you, yeah, moved to Ukraine. Yeah. That's a, that's a uh, climate change, at least what Indeed. I perceive. The I've never been to the Ukraine, so but what I perceive, it's you know, cold. Uh, in the winter, it is. They have actual seasons, whereas Arizona really just has like two. <laughs> on, on <and laughs> but off. they've got the full scope of seasons. Yeah, okay. so it's hot in the summer. You know, leaves fall in the fall, okay. uh, and it gets cold in the winter, and it snows, and then it goes back to spring, and everything blooms. Oh, it's a really beautiful country. Yeah. Okay. The similarities between Western Washington and Arizona are not. No, they're not. To me, Arizona's desert. I, when I think of Arizona, I think like a Phoenix and Scottsdale. And I know that, you know, up, up in the north, it gets a little cooler. But I think of the 115 degrees of blast furnace heat from what seems to be like from June till May, you know, like 11 months of the year. I know it's not true. Do you enjoy <laughs> like Western it, Washington's damp, dreary climate compared to? In the, and I say that because I lived, I grew up on the west side of the state. And in 2017, we moved over here to central Washington because I couldn't take the gray and the rain anymore. I just couldn't do it. Um, so do you like the Western Washington side? I absolutely do. When I moved here, um, my husband is actually from here originally. Okay. He's, um, he's from Shelton, Washington. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And I felt home. I felt at home immediately. Okay. I'd been to visit in Seattle and it was actually, you know, kind of on my radar to, maybe move here someday. Right. And when I did, you know, it wasn't super planned out to make that happen, but <laughs> yeah, I absolutely love it. I can deal with the gray. I do um, frequently try to plan my visits home to Arizona. I still have family there. Right. I try to plan that home in uh, my visits home in the peak of gray season because <laughs> it's, it gets a little rough. You got to break it up a little bit. Um, but the summers here are just unsurpassed. They're okay. phenomenal. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I poke fun at Seattle a lot, but there's so much to do in the area. And, you know, if if traffic was no problem, which we know it obviously is, but <laughs> if traffic was no problem. I mean, literally you could go from the Pacific to the tallest mountain in the in the 48 states in, in a day. I mean, when you think about the, the variety that we have in this state, it's pretty cool. So enough about Seattle and all of that. Let's talk cider. Okay. What's the backstory on Seattle Cider? How long has it been in business? How did it get started? All of that stuff. Sure. Um, so Seattle Cider started in 2013. Uh, we actually have a sibling company uh, that's a brewery. Mm -hmm. And the reason that it started um, was, you know, looking into a gluten-free alcoholic beverage option. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, so we started in 2013. We are the first cidery that opened in Seattle proper since the repeal of Prohibition, which is like, you know, 1933. So 80 years later, mm -hmm. in Only a 80. very Apple friendly state, um, we, you know, someone finally found a way to make some different use of some really amazing apples. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of why, you know, that's the Seattle cider is not your standard cider. Mm -hmm. And the reason being behind that, you know, you could start finding in 2013, you could start finding um, some cideries in the area, or you could find some cider at grocery stores. 
in general, it was really, really sweet, um, sometimes to the point of like cloyingly sweet. And, you know, as starting with this sibling company that's a brewery, it's like, okay, well, we could make cider, but let's do it a little different. Let's let's try for a drier option. Let's try for something that sort of bridges that gap between wine and beer. Um, and, you know, that's that's how it came about. A lot of, a lot of trial through the process and just making drier ciders. Mm-hmm. Um, but they don't have to be sweet to be palatable. In fact, I personally prefer a much drier cider. Okay. All right. Yeah, my tastes run a little, not, 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 I don't want my treetop apple juice with, with, with alcohol in it, but um, I do tend to like semi-sweet maybe, maybe is what we would mm-hmm. call it. Not, not, not like you said, cloyingly, that's, that's a really good word to describe it. Sometimes you're like, but when they're like dusty, dusty dry, I, I, I don't like dusty dry wine either. So mm-hmm. I don't, I guess my palate's just not as sophisticated as it should be. I mean, not should be, but it, it, you know, it can, it can improve. (laughs) I don't, you know, I don't think that that makes your palate, you know, sophisticated or unsophisticated. Your palate is your palate. Your palate's not wrong. Right. Um, Some people would argue uh, that my palate's wrong. (laughs) Okay. I won't be that person (laughs) to argue and say that your palate is wrong, but you like what you like. Right. Um, That being said though, uh, I will frequently tell people um, that, you know, if they're adamant that, oh, I, I really just don't like cider. Well, try more. Mm-hmm. Try more cider. You maybe just haven't found one that you like. That sounds you know, like our- a marketing person. <laughs> try more. That's fair, right? Try some <laughs> no. new things. Oh, no, you don't but, like this one? Great. Try another one. But, that, you know? but absolutely, that's fair because just you try, you know, brand X dry cider and you're like, no, nah, I don't like it. Well, try brand try brand wise dry side. Oh, this actually, is, there's something here I like. So yes. Yeah. Not- you um, mentioned as, as a, your preference for wines, do you like, you know, a sparkling wine? Do you like a, um, do you like champagnes at all? Not really. I no, I, not for truthfully, you. Okay. with wine, I'd be that person that you could literally take to a blind taste test and sit me down and have me and, and and present the wines properly too, by the way, not just, you know, in a, in a Mason jar type thing, but just present the wines properly in their pro- pro- appropriate servings, all these things and, ha- and blind taste test. And you could run me from a box wine to a super high end wine. I wouldn't bet on me picking the high end wine. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, I, tend <laughs> I think to, that's like, pretty frequently like the case with a lot of people, though. I did have one time I had a, a wine tasting experience down in Texas where a friend of mine brought something out of his cellar and we were having dinner at their house and great steaks. It was a great meal. Right. And he brings out this bottle and he's he's like you can just tell it's like he's like the guy's glowing. He's radiating. He's like like almost shaking to like bring this thing out. And I'm like. Mm-hmm. And. I can't remember what it was, but it was delicious. I mean, it really was a an amazing glass of wine. So we finish the wine, and I can tell he's like wanting to tell me because he's he's not a name dropping guy, but he, he could, I could tell it. So I, he starts telling me the story of the wine, and okay, okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and he goes and it's twelve hundred a bottle. Wow! And I realized that I I just had a you know three hundred dollar glass of wine. <laughs> and I was like, I'm never going to buy a $1,200 single serving because wine to me is a single serving. You're going to open the wine. You're going to consume the wine with by yourself or with friends. It's not like a bottle of whiskey that you're going to put back on the, in the, in the counter. That was a delicious wine, but I'm never going to pay 1200 bucks a bottle. So, I, but you could. <laughs> uh, same, honestly. <laughs> but you know, I have tried stuff in the, you know, 50 to hundred range and I've tried a box wine and honestly the box wine's like, yeah, I like it. I just, I don't, I don't pick up on the tasting notes, so I don't drink wine. Okay. Um, well, I so can't. with regard to cider though, I think like that's one of the things about craft cider and what we're doing with craft cider is an accessibility piece, right? Mm-hmm. We have it in cans. Yep. That's, you know, seems pretty easy. Like you can pick up cans at your grocery store. You can get it on draft. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a really, really good product. 
it's also not $1,200 a can or for, you know, a four pack. So somebody who's picking up a beverage, like you can just pick up a four pack and try that. That's Maybe not that should be cost a new strategy. prohibitive. Marketing is like put out a $1,200 four pack just to see if you could get that ultra premium cider market. <laughs> just one, just, just one, just, just one that's available. <laughs> In, in, and I can't drink beer anymore because if I have a beer the next day, I wake up like I had 20 of them and it just, beer doesn't. So it's like I've, I've, I've moved to cider and I don't, I mean, I enjoy it greatly. And that's why we're been, we've been talking to so many of the cider makers in around the state because you guys all have interesting stories. And because the state, like you said, you know, we're kind of an apple friendly state. Yeah. If, we are in apple country. Yeah. So, when Seattle Cider launched their first cider, you mentioned cans. Have you guys always canned or did you start just on draft or with bottles or what's the evolution to where we're at today? Yeah, we went um, out the gate directly into cans. Okay. Part of that is that, you know, it's an accessibility piece. Um, part of that is that we're a very outdoor focused company. So mm -hmm. that idea of pack it in, pack it out. We were talking about the accessibility um, of, you know, beautiful green spaces to go and visit your hikers, your climbers, your kayakers, um, folks who've, you know, kind of put in their work doing some outdoor fun activities, you might want to celebrate a little bit after that. Sure. And you don't necessarily want to bring a glass bottle out right. into, and it's in fact, it discouraged, highly right. discouraged to be bringing glass bottles of things when you're going to, you know, um, state parks, national parks, when you're going on trails, don't do that. Um, so if you bring a can of something, you know, you pack it in, you pack it out. It's, right. No. It's just easier that way, but okay. that it doesn't have to necessarily be, it can be something really good, mm -hmm. right? You mm -hmm. know, you can, you can bring something that's absolutely delicious that, um, you know, when I first started drinking craft beverages, they weren't coming in cans that dates myself a little bit, but that was, that was an early and newer thing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when I'm in college, like your craft beers, they came in bottles you were always getting them in bottles and so the advent of being able to get a really good beverage that comes in a can mm -hmm. that's still relatively new if you think about it so or i want to think that it's new so it doesn't make me feel so old but to date myself <laughs> craft beer when i was in college was rainier um it was you know we didn't actually I, red hook had just just started and it was like they call it, it was Ballard bitter was one that they had. That was their mm -hmm. IPA. And it was like, we found Ballard bitter. It's like, Oh, this is expensive. I'm, I'll go back to right near. Um, but so I predate you as far as that. So I'm looking on your, your website. And so what did you got? What was the initial launch? What was the initial cider that Seattle cider came to market with? Yeah, we launched with, um, with dry and semi-sweet. So okay. we were talking about um, different flavors. Our dry is still our flagship. That's um, has absolutely zero residual sugar. So um, it's, it's bone dry, um, mm -hmm. but it also, you know, has a really nice complex, but balanced flavor and drinks a little bit more, you know, like a sparkling wine or almost champagne like, because mm -hmm. it has like a really nice carbonation level. Um, don't need any sugar to have that be nice and balanced and it's done really well for us and it's continued to be our flagship semi-sweet um, that has a little bit more we talk about the sweetness of our ciders in terms of bricks which is mm -hmm. also really similar to wine there's a lot of parallels there um, we actually have a winery license um, it's fermented the same way that you would make wine except you're using apple juice okay. um, and our semi-sweet that's one of the sweeter ciders that we make um, it's semi-sweet as a flavor profile, but it's one of the sweetest ciders that we make, which is 2.6 bricks. Okay. And what's so the dry? The dry is zero bricks. Zero bricks. Yeah. Okay. There's no, there's no residual sugar left. Okay. All right. And I'm looking here now and you have more than two. We have quite a few. Yes. Quite a few. <laughs> Before we start talking about what you currently have, did you guys ever try one? You came up with this idea that you're going to, do I know somebody's I know a couple of people who actually tried to put coffee and cider together, which is I love coffee. I love cider, but I don't think I, I don't know. We Did have done ever, a cold brew cider before. You have? Yeah, we have done a cold brew cider before. We didn't can it. Um that was only available on draft. It was delicious. Really? 
Yeah. I want to believe you. I truly do. (laughs) I really, I mean, because it's like, hmm, but at the same time, try to walk me through why, why you thought, why you thought it was delicious. It had everything to do with the flavor profile, right? So it was everything that I love about cider and everything that I love about cold brew nicely meshed together. Okay. It was a good, it was a good balance. It had that like little bitterness that you get from coffee that we've come to know and love. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it still allowed the apple character to shine through. Interesting. So yeah, it was a best of both worlds situation where, you know, we have a couple of different flavors too that... You know, if I'm out at a festival or if I am happen to be behind the bar and people are asking for recommendations, a lot of times I will start with, okay, it sounds like a strange combination, but it really works. Um, I feel that way with like our basil mint cider. That one's been really popular. It started out as a seasonal and became so popular that we do it year round now. Okay. Basil and mint and apple. It sounds like an interesting combination. It's really lovely. It pairs well with a ton of different foods. Um, okay. It's one of my favorite go-tos that we still have. And we co-ferment it with, you know, 100 pounds each of uh, fresh basil, fresh mint, and then, of course, the apple juice. So when you're using 100 pounds of, of those, how, how big a batch are you producing? So we do um, typically 200 barrel batches at a okay. time. You'll have right. to come by for a visit sometime and see the tanks. They're pretty massive. Yeah, that's that's those are big tanks. Yeah. So, stuff all right, them full so of we, basil, stuff them full of mint, and then uh, we stuff bags full of them. They look kind of like laundry bags, and then you throw like, those in like a tea bag. bag. If you will. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, then you can pull them back out, right. and it's a little bit easier on the tank cleaning aspect <laughs> for all of our cider makers. So they're appreciative of uh, of that concept too. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what we got, I got a little derailed, but so it was this, I was making fun of the idea of coffee and cider and you, you know, you threw me a curveball and said, you like it, but have you guys ever tried like putting a couple items together that in theory sound good, but didn't quite make it? Oh, sure. I think there's a fair number of things that kind of, you know, hit the cutting room floor. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's a great way of putting it. So what's hit the cutting room floor that you, that you personally thought might've been like, oh, that sounds good, but just. Yeah, it didn't work. Oh, gosh. And to think about some things that... Well, so let me give you a little bit of background story about how we determine okay. what ciders, like, what ciders go where, right? Okay. Because we have... Um, currently, we have a team of three cider makers, and then we also have a research and development manager um, who also makes cider. And they're, you know, constantly working on, like, the things that we have that are going out and sell well, but they're also always working on innovations. All of our cider makers, after they've been with the company for a year, get to, you know, wild card, pick whatever they want and make a batch of cider, whatever they feel like. Well, let me, let me interrupt you. Yeah. Not a 200 gallon batch. No, no. Okay. We have the, we have the ability to make some smaller batches. Okay. All yes. right. I was going to say, wow, that's a, okay. It's a big gamble, right? Yeah, so yeah, we don't, big... we don't do the 200 barrel batches uh, barrel, for, yeah. for all of the. Yeah, 200 um, barrel. What is that? That's like over a thousand gallons. It's a lot. Yeah. I okay. So, the... so we're <laughs> not, we're not giving Tony the, the cider maker a chance to. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So we are, yeah, we're, we're experimenting and trying to innovate all the time and, you know, some things work better than others. And sometimes, you know, you make a batch of something and you're like, oh, this like sounds like a phenomenal combination. And maybe that batch just needs to be tweaked. So we have, um, we actually put every single one of our staff through cider school. We do regular education so you can learn how to pick out off flavors. So you know how to taste cider. Um, And then we have a process where there's, you know, grading and scoring of ciders to determine, is this good enough to go on draft for customers to try in our tasting room? Mm -hmm. Or even further, you know, those next steps, is this something that we either keg or package in cans and this now can go out to our consumers? Because it's really important that it hits a certain level with trained, you know, with our trained cider makers, with all of our trained staff Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that it is good enough and hits our brand standards for people to taste it. Right. The ones that don't, um, they don't. (laughs) Sure. No, I mean, without innovation though, you're not going to, I mean, innovation implies that you're going to have, failure is a hard, harsh word, but you know, you're going to, you know, 
pair something together and it just didn't work. And like you said, maybe, maybe you tweak the recipe and, you, you know, version five makes it to the, where it was. And that's actually a lot of what happens is that, um, you know, we aren't necessarily going to completely discount a cider with XYZ flavor combination. Mm -hmm. It just might require some refining and then further refining and then further refining beyond that. And so sometimes we're, um, when we're doing like our quality, you know, QA, QC, when we're doing those processes, we might be comparing four different batches of this particular cider to see which one we like best and then right. moving forward and further refining. So, you know, getting something to like, by the time something comes to market, it might have gone through, you know, 10 different iterations for us to get to the specific recipe and like dial in the process to make sure it's exactly where we want it to be. Mm -hmm. So there haven't been any like, I don't know. The other thing is like what we were talking about with palate. Um, there's a couple of ciders like me personally that I'm like, well, that's not for me. And that's just mm -hmm. my palate. Right. Sure. Um, that other people absolutely have loved. And so I just don't drink the ones that I don't like. Well, give Thankfully me an example it's few and far that, between. Give me an example of one that you, just doesn't work for your palate. Um, let's see. We haven't made this one in a while. We made a spruce cider um, and we actually took an entire spruce tree and put it in a tank with the cider and co-fermented. Um, I'll have to find, I have a picture of this somewhere I'll have to send to you because it's pretty funny to see. Um, for me, it just wasn't for my palate, but it's a fan favorite for some. Really? Yeah. And then likewise, you know, um, one that I do absolutely love, but that's, you know, maybe not for everybody. Um, I love our three pepper cider. So we make a cider that has poblano, habanero, and jalapeno peppers in it. Um, it is a little spicy around the cidery on the cider pad when they're making it. Like you can, you know, you can tell there's capsaicin in the air. Uh -huh. Um I love that one. I think it's phenomenal. I drink it as is. I make it into cocktails. Um and it has this like wild cult following to the point that like we decided to start canning it um, and we sell it in our tasting room and we sell it on draft. Um, I think it's delicious and, but not everybody loves it, but those who love it really love it. And so, so there was a call to like, put it in package. We can't get enough of it. You know, do you like spicy foods? I do. I'm from Arizona. Okay. That, okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't know that that's an inherent Arizona no, quality, you, you, but that was, I walked into that one. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, um, I when actually, this is kind of funny. When I first started working here, um, I would always have bottles of hot sauce at my desk. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I would determine how long, like I could almost tell how long I'd been there by how many bottles of hot sauce I had gone through. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh my gosh. That was about like one bottle of Valentina per month. So what do you like for, have you found any hot sauces made up here in Washington that you like, or are the hot sauces that you appreciate coming from the Southwest? I am particularly obsessed with the pineapple habanero salsa that comes um, at El Chupacabre. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Like okay. I could drink it. Um, as far as ones that I buy at the store though, like, you know, it's, we go through at my house, we go through a lot of Frank's red hot, um, okay. a ton of Valentina. That's my go-to, um, lots of Sriracha. Cause that's great on everything as well. Um, Cholula, Tapatio. Okay. And Tapatio seems like table stakes, you know, that's like, you know, fancy ketchup. A little and bit. I, yeah. And, but if and you've I got like it, it like, yeah, yeah, if that's the son, only option for hot sauce, I'll use it. Mm -hmm. Um, but absent of that, typically I'm, I'm, going through the Valentina pretty, pretty quickly. My son likes re the ridiculous stuff. The, you know, ghost peppers infused with nuclear waste. Uh, <laughs> you know, just, just the stuff that are like, um, the ones that feel like feats of strength to consume them. Like, <laughs> yes. You know, and you're miserable. And you're every time. You're, yeah. yeah. And then have you ever been up to, uh, in Montlake Terrace, have you ever gone to double D meats? No. So there's a, a, a meat, a meat a butchery up in Montlake Terrace area and they have a full aisle dedicated to hot sauces. Oh, nice. And I mean, hundreds of them. So I'm not a hot sauce and wine, you know, like my palate, you know, but the, 
the sheer, it's overwhelming to walk in there and see the hundreds of varieties of hot sauces that you can torture yourself with. So you might check that out. I will have to check that out. Um, typically when I travel anywhere, what I bring back as souvenirs is hot sauce because everybody has enough stuff, but um, you can never have too much hot sauce. Right. And fun fact, this is like, we'll pull it back to the cider realm again right. for a second. Um, cider is a really good palate cleanser. Mm-hmm. Yes. So frequently um, we will often pour our ciders at beer festivals and mm-hmm. we actually stay pretty busy in our tents when we're pouring at beer festivals and folks will come by after they've had something either like really heavy or that, you know, was a little more flavor forward than they were expecting. And you get that really nice reprieve. You get that palate cleanse from drinking some cider. That's actually a really good point. I like that. Okay. It's refreshing. goes with everything. Okay. So, Circling back to your cider. So we've kind of talked about the basil mint. We've talked about the dry. We've talked about the semi-sweet. You brought up three pepper because I was going to bring it up. You brought up the spruce one, which is not on this, but you have a gin botanical. We do. Yeah. And so help me out here as I'm reading this. What? So, so when I read them, so when I read the, 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 the description for your basil, basil mint says fermented with fresh basil and mint leaves. Mm-hmm. The gin botanical says fermented with fresh basil and mint leaves. So. Oh, well what, then, then there's something incorrect on our website. So I'll be checking on that. When I sorry. Get off the call. Sorry to publicly. Um, no, but, that's okay. But it starts out, it says, yeah, it's, you know what? It's the exact same text between the two of them. Yeah. Well, so that's not correct. Our gym botanical. Okay. okay. That's good to know. Well, I'll fix it after. That's an easy Sorry. fix. No, that's okay. <laughs> hey, at least now I know. Um, can't fix it if you don't know what's wrong, right? Um, with our gym botanical, we make it with um, spent botanicals that are used for making gin. So okay. you're getting, you know, juniper, verbena, lemon. Um, it's that one's a really lovely cider that's very um, gin on the nose and then kind of finishes with gin. So it's almost like having it's it's very canned cocktail adjacent, but you're still mm. getting the same alcohol by volume that a cider is. So that one I think is like 6.9%. Um, but yeah, we're using spent botanicals that are made from gin. So you're getting that gin character, but you're mm-hmm. also still getting the apple flavor. So I think the best way I can say that like that kind of comes across is like a, it's like a gin and, cider cocktail together where are you getting the spent botanicals oh that's a good question um we've had some partners before um from distilleries that we get spent botanicals from and i don't know who we're particularly working with on on this most recent batch um, because it's changed over the years but there's a lot of really phenomenal distilleries in washington and so um you know it's just another way that um we can kind of repurpose things right yeah, no, that it's very was green kind of, cool. of us. Yeah. Right. No, that's kind of a cool, um, you know, the fact that, you know, let's say I'll arbitrarily say big gin, um, use them and then get the botanicals from them, repurposing them again, more use out of them. I think that's awesome. Okay. So you've got honey crisp, berry rose, marionberry, pineapple agave. And then you've got some sparkling ones. So let's, let's stop. We won't go to the sparkling yet. So, Oh, and you have Odyssey. Yeah, Odyssey is an imperial cider. So that one's that one's a heavy hitter. Um, imperial, just similar to like, you know, IPA versus double IPA. We've mm-hmm. got cider and then we've got imperial cider. Okay. And it means it's got a higher ABV. Mm-hmm. Um, that one's in at 8.4%. Okay. And we back sweeten that with brown sugar. So you get mm. a little bit more like depth of flavor. Um, it's a little dangerous because it does not drink like 8.4%. So I like to tell people that before they start down that road. Um, it's mm. really nicely balanced and, um, you know, but it'll also, it can catch up with you because it's 8.4. <laughs> That's actually not because it's 8.4. That's not why I'm saying it's intriguing. Um, the brown sugar is interesting to me. That's interesting. I'm going to have to try it. that. That not, That's when I want to go out and I'll find locally here and, and give it a, is it available in stores or is that only available? Okay. Cool. Yeah, it's absolutely available in stores. Okay. Still trying to gain some additional placements for that. We released that one. Um, let's see. Was that 2021? 
okay, we were so pretty busy new. with yeah that one's pretty it's pretty new to us um we were really busy with innovation you know starting in 2020 we kind of hunkered down and started so, doing gee, um, a bunch of fun stuff so yeah we kept busy <laughs> mm-hmm. so you do a lot of you know fruit fruit combos here with the marion berry and with pineapple you've got the honey crisp so is that just is that just 100% honey crisp apples or what's the what's That's honey that? crisp that is honey crisp juice honey crisp apples yeah okay. um something so typically when we make our ciders um with the exception of dry which you know has no residual sugar if mm-hmm. we're back sweetening we typically back sweeten with either pure cane sugar or in the case of odyssey we use brown sugar mm-hmm. um we do that in part because it allows us a little bit more control over um the final bricks of the product with Honeycrisp, we did back sweetening with Honeycrisp juice. Mm-hmm. And the goal with that, and that was one that was a long time um, in you know the R&D process. The goal with that is that your experience drinking Honeycrisp cider is like taking a bite out of a Honeycrisp apple. Okay. And it is, it really works. If you like a Honeycrisp apple and you you know, are interested in trying cider, that's a really good one to try. Because that's kind of the darling of the palm fruits, right? Like everybody knows what a Honeycrisp apple is. It's got, you know, a household name. It feels familiar. Mm -hmm. Um, You can find it at every grocery store or farmer's market. It's super approachable. And there's a reason for it. It's just really good. It's a consistently delicious apple. um, And it's a consistently delicious cider for sure. So, Sale cider, you're not, are you, you're not growing your own fruit, right? No, but we do get all of our apples from Washington. That's been okay. a really important thing for us. Um, we're in a pretty industrial area. We're not an orchard based cidery. You know, we're over here in Soto with like, you know, trains and traffic. Come and on. you got plenty of room for an orchard. <laughs> We do have two apple trees. We actually have apple trees um, and they're Honeycrisp apple trees on either end of our tasting room. Okay. So our tasting room is like located in the same place where we do all our production for the brewery and for the cidery. Um, it's called The Woods and we share it. It's about 50-50 in terms of like what taps have cider and what taps have beer. Um, and we do, we have two little apple trees that are just kind of chugging along. Chugging along. Because we're in a pretty industrial area, I wouldn't necessarily eat the apples from them. That's sort of more ornamental and, you know, part of like our aesthetic for the tasting room. But um, beyond that, we're we're getting all of our apples in Washington. We've got, you know, crisp, per- <laughs> yeah. you know, a bite of a honey crisp with a, the, a, a, a hint of diesel. Yeah, just, pretty much, pretty yeah. much. Um, right. We've uh, we've been known to use the apples like when we'll do photo shoots on the marketing team, but sure, we don't usually eat them after. Yeah, I I, I don't. Okay, so you so you are getting your your apples in Washington State. Okay, mm-hmm. are are you pressing the apples in Seattle, or do you are you bringing in the juice pressed from from wherever you're getting the apples from? We bring in our juice pre-pressed. So it comes in, um, it comes in in trucks and, you know, there's basically when you walk around the warehouse, everything is, you know, tanks, hoses, clamps, cans, and lots of boxes. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're just pumping it directly into the tanks. Uh, when it arrives, we get deliveries that are between, you know, 5,000 and 8,000 gallons of juice at a time and, you know, plan ahead and then just plan for the ferment. Lots of clipboards everywhere, tracking everything that's happening uh, from tank to tank. You mentioned can, so you have your own canning line in the in the we warehouse. We do, we do. Um, we actually have two canning lines. We have, oh, wow. a, yeah, we have a canning line that uh, we use for our beer, and then we have okay. a canning line that we use for our cidery. Okay. And the cider side, we're running that canning line like five days a week. Wow. Yeah. Has anyone ever knocked over a stack of can blanks? It has happened. Um, I haven't seen it happen. I don't think it's happened in recent time. Um, I laugh a little bit because my office is, I I say to people that I'm located in a can fort. If you Mm -hmm. walk out of my office, I am surrounded by stacks and stacks, pallet after pallet of cans. Uh, And sometimes I have like a little labyrinth to get into my office to do some work. Um, I haven't really seen any get knocked over. The reason, so back in the nineties, I I had a job with a vending machine company, filling vending machines. And one of the accounts I covered was the ball can plant down in Auburn. Okay. So the giant, you know, where they're making the, making the cans 
and they would stack these things up, you know, 15, 30 feet in the air. And they're moving them around with, with pallet jacks and, or not pallet jacks, forklifts. And one day I was in filling a vending machine and a guy swung his forklift blades and just knocked over like three stacks of cans. Oh, I don't know if anything could be guy. ever louder than that. It was amazing. And the guy is just, I, I'm, he's still probably ashamed of himself today. I mean, he just, it was hanging and they literally had to go and pick him up can by can. You know. Oh no. And yeah. So adding always, insult to injury on that. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, thousands of empty can blanks just knocked over and it was, it was so noisy. It was, yeah. If you, if they ever do it while you're at work, you'll know. Oh, absolutely. You'll know. <laughs> I've joked about, um, you know, times when like the, the can pallet, like the, all the pallet stacks have gotten a little close to my front door that I'm like, if you don't leave me enough space to get out, I'm just going to, you know, pull a Kool-Aid man and bust through. But I don't <laughs> think I'd ever manage to be able to do that because I'd probably, you know, really man. injure myself on that. Uh, so I have not done that, thankfully. No, it's, you know, it's like a live action Tetris game around here all the time. <laughs> bringing in just stacks of cans and, you know, our warehouse team, they are constantly moving things from one side of the warehouse to the other, whether it's, you know, bringing empty cans over to be filled and then off packing um, case after case of cider and then, you know, bringing those out to the loading dock. So those can go out to our distributors. Like there's usually a good amount of action happening. (laughs) Well, and it's not like, you know, down in Soto, it's not like you can probably expand too much either because everything's taken down there. It's pretty packed, but we've gotten lucky. Um, Every time we've had, you know, neighbors uh, move out from a space that's like adjacent to us, we fill up the space. We talk to our landlord and we're like, can we have that space? We'll take it. Um, Because we did a build out in 2019. We added like 7,000 more square feet. Okay. And we needed it. And then we immediately, you know, goldfished that and filled up the space with things. Um, that's where we brought in a new, our newest canning line that we have, which is, it's, it's pretty massive. Um, mm-hmm. Goes through a lot of cans. So you, you're, you're currently canning five days a week. Yeah. On average. Yeah. You're running that just one shift. You're running that multiple shifts. Right now we're doing one. Um, okay. We've done it before where we've done like morning shift and evening shift. Um, our team running all the logistics, they're really impressive and have managed to make that work with one. Um, and, you know, our packaging team is really well trained and like know how to, you know, figure out all of the, all of the very like minutia details that need to make all of these things happen. But it, mm-hmm. it's a pretty well oiled machine, honestly. Okay. One question, and we're, I'm not purposely avoiding the brewery because we're talking cider today. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely talk beer in another conversation, but approximately how many people work there? So there's a lot of crossover between the two. Um, Our whole staff between the two is about 35 people, which is actually like you know, not a, not a crazy amount. Um, no, but that's still, you know, small, but, but mighty. And if you take out our two brewers, which like their job is specific to brewing, mm-hmm. um, everyone else, you know, kind of wears multiple hats and works for both companies. So about right. 33 then. And is that including the tap room as well? Yeah. That's our bartenders, our sales team, our marketing team, oh, okay. um, leadership, admin, packaging, cider makers, um, our HR, it's, you know, finance and AP, like that's, it's everybody. It's pretty, you know, it's, it's businesses, you know, think about that. You're, you're, that company is providing income for 35 households. Absolutely. It's really fantastic. Yeah. I, yeah. you know, I really can't say enough nice things about the people that I work with. It's why I've stayed here. Um, yeah. That and our products are fantastic. I love them, but okay. I do, I work with some of just the kindest and hardest working people that you could ever ask to work with. And they're really passionate about what they do. And there's, I think, a really strong sense of ownership for the work that mm-hmm. they do. Um, and, you know, we've got a good company culture. So that those pieces are all really, really important. Um, yeah, and no, we've got absolutely. a really great group of folks that I work with. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. You have to pick your favorite. You can only have one cider for the rest of your days. It's the only cider you're ever going to be able to drink again. What's it going to be? Totally I'm going to go ridiculous question. <laughs> I can ask. Oh, I can't pick two. That is hard. Um, you know what? 
I'm I'm going to go with our light cider, which we haven't talked about yet and which a lot of people haven't tasted yet. So you're going to have to take my word for it. But it is, it's really good. I think the other thing too is because you said, you know, if this is what I'm going to drink for the rest of my days, um, that's, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, but it's really phenomenal and it's a little bit lower ABV. So like if I'm going to only drink one for the rest of my days, then I get to have a few. Okay. Each time. I'll let you have a second one. Cause you were, you know, you kind of like, what would, what would the other one be? The other one would be our honey crisp. Okay. Yeah. That's that. Um, I was having a hard choice. <laughs> okay. Also, you know, I'm a Libra. I'm inherently indecisive. I'm like, Oh, you're going to make me pick one. I, yeah. I'm like, also a little bit of a rule breaker. So I'm like, I'm probably just going to pick two anyway. So those are my two. <laughs> I typically, if I ask, I know I'm going to get more than one because nobody's just going to say, you know, I, you know, I'm going to do X, you know, but let's talk about your sparkling stuff before we go to the light cider. Cause I think the light cider deserves, I've got questions. So <laughs> help me out here. So the, the sparklings are, well, they seem like they're lower in carbs and sugar than I might expect. Mm-hmm. So are these apple based? They are. Uh, okay. Basically, like our plan with making the sparkling Seattle cider sparkling was to do something that was seltzer adjacent. Okay. And, you know, you've got all your other big names. I won't say them. Everybody knows what they are and who they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, they have a place in the world. That market for seltzer has been um it's been massive. It's, Mm -hmm. uh, it was like one of the most quickly growing categories. Um, although it's starting to slow down a little bit while cider is growing. Um, but you know, seltzers came onto the scene and I think a lot of folks were kind of scrambling to make something that was seltzer or seltzer adjacent. The difference with this being that it is apple based and that we use natural ingredients and things that, you know, occur in nature. And so (laughs) flavor profile wise, it's, they're delicious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you have to pick just one. You're going to go with the blood orange, the papaya, or the Meyer lemon? Papaya. Okay. That was easy. See, that was an mm-hmm. easy one. All right. Let's talk light cider. Yes, let's. So, I'm excited. <laughs> okay. So before before we got on the call today, I, I logged, and no, I didn't log into your website, but I was on your website and I see this this big, big banner, you know, as it rotates through and you're having light cider coming out in July of 2022. So depending on when you listen to this, it might not be available. It might already have been out for a while. So what was the motivation to create a light product and how did we bring this to market? Yeah. Um, our motivation with this is essentially category creation. Um, if you look at, I know we weren't going to talk about beer, but this is important for this part of the conversation. When you're looking at beer, um, whether it's, you know, big beer, um, or otherwise, and you're looking at some of the key players, they've got their regular and then their light. And if you're thinking about, you know, imagine if you will, sort of the quintessential backyard barbecue and what people are rolling up with like six packs to share with their friends and grill outside and enjoy, you know, an outside experience, there needed to be a space for that for cider as well. So light cider is our answer to light beer. That's the most closely adjacent piece to that. Um, It is, you know, shockingly simple in like in its production, right? It's very similar to what we do um, with dry or with semi-sweet. So Mm -hmm. it's apple base and, you know, there's no adjunct flavors. There's no like co-fermentation. It's just fresh press Washington apples and okay. um, it's a light version. So this is sort of that, you know, your lawnmower cider, right? Instead of your lawnmower beer, this is your, uh, your porch pounders, <laughs> this like very like crushable, drinkable, you can have a couple of them right? Um, and it's super refreshing. So w- what, what are you doing differently to make this light? What's the, I mean, is it, yeah, what's, how many calories would be in a can approximately? 98. And how many cans are in, or how many cans, how many calories are in, say, a Honeycrisp can? Oh, I got to look. That one is, it's a little higher, but um, that one's probably like, I want to say like 160, 190, something like that. So, So almost 
half off, if you will, calories. Yeah. Okay. Well, so uh, here's the thing though. Um, inherently ciders that are not incredibly sweet, right? Ciders mm -hmm. that are not incredibly sweet are actually pretty low calorie. Um, right. so our dry, for example, like, you know, it's, I guess like keto friendly. I don't know. I don't do keto. Um, <laughs> but it's on the, you know, it's on the lighter side of, it's on the lighter side of calorie content, right? right. It's on the lighter side of carbs, mm -hmm. um, sugar content, all of those things. But, um, this is something that has come up pretty frequently with like the American Cider Association. Um, that's, you know, a U.S wide uh membership like cider specific industry specific membership piece uh, i sit on the marketing committee for the american cider association and it's something that's come up frequently is that cider out the gate like was very concerned about talking about like apple varietals and some of the mo more like esoteric aspects of cider making mm -hmm. and that conversation hasn't had the same level of accessibility for your everyday drinker light cider it just is obvious. This is a light version. So this is for the light beer drinkers. This is for mm -hmm. um, folks who want to drink something that's a little bit lighter, both in terms of ABV and in calories and all of that. So it just, it's easy and it's obvious um, and it's super drinkable. Like there's just a ton of flavor packed into this. So it's like, it's light without being watered down. You know, it's light without mm -hmm. like lacking that flavor piece. Um, the flavor profile is really important. Like that's a big part of our brand standard is like hitting that really, you know, apple forward flavor profile that makes you want to crack open another. Right. Um, and so with this, it was part in making, you know, this really delicious liquid, but then also like creating this packaging that makes it super obvious to what it is because it's a light cider. So we're, we're trying to, we're trying to creep in and like take some of that part of the light beer market with light cider because that just needs to exist. That's, you know, we're answering a call from like our consumer base. That's like, Oh yeah, this is like what people want to drink. Um, so we're excited to be able to be the ones making that. And, you know, from our process, one of the things we've been talking about a lot is sort of like this story of light cider. It's like, what do you get when you ask your cider makers what they want to drink? What do you get mm -hmm. when you, you know, when you ask your cider makers, what do you want to drink after you've been making cider all day? Like something, you know, your, your shift drink afterwards, this is why we have it on a secret tap. Um, <laughs> <you're>, <laughs> we have a secret tap uh, in our tasting room and employee taps and things like that. Cause you know, we've got to be, you got to be able to try what you're making. You got to make sure right. that it, you know, hits those standards. Um, this is exactly it. The whole point was like, what would, what would we want to drink after work? What do you want to drink after your hike, after, you know, after you go kayak or ride your bike? Like, it's just, it's really refreshing and it doesn't, um, it's light. So, you know, it doesn't feel heavy. It's all of those things. So the name of it, it was, you know, pretty simple in that, like, what are we trying to do? Well, it's a light cider. I, I, the reason I've been kind of smirking while you're telling me this is the can looks like a beer can. I mean, it <laughs> looks, it does, yeah. it, 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 I could see somebody walking into a local grocery store and grabbing this thinking they were grabbing light beer. It That's looks like, it looks like a beer can. I mean, it's, it looks very different than the rest of your packaging. Um, yeah, you know, for that, um, we'd experimented a little bit with kind of stepping outside of our own, you know, prescribed box of, of what our branding looks like when we made Odyssey and uh, the Imperial Cider we were talking about before. And that worked really well for us. You know, we've got kind of our core lineup mm -hmm. um, with the dry semi-sweet, like our, our year rounds and our seasonals. And then Odyssey was, we were doing something really different. And so likewise, when we, um, and it's been really fun. This is actually part of what my team gets to do. I have two in-house designers who've been working really hard on kind of storytelling through the packaging over the course mm -hmm. of however many months. Um, to, you know, figure out like, how do we tell that story of this is like light beer? And so to hear you say that is great. I'm like, okay, mission accomplished. I'm checking yeah, no, that box. We did a good job then. That was, that was really what we were looking for um, when, you know, to have that on the shelf that, that people will understand, um, you know, because it's not always going to be people in our tasting room where our bartenders know all of this great information about our ciders or, you know, we can't just 
plant a salesperson in the grocery aisle or a convenience store <laughs> everywhere to be like, let me tell you why you should pick this one. You know, that um, would be kind of funny and um, a little bit weird. I think people might be kind of weirded out by having like, like a like random have a person, person there. inside the beer cabinet, you know, like when you open the door up and there's somebody like, Hey, try this, you know, this is light cider. <laughs> yes. Um, um, and so since that, <laughs> that wasn't possible, um, we try to do that through our packaging. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, Hey, that made me feel really great. I'm excited to tell my team about that yeah, response no, it, there. It looks like a beer can without looking like I'm looking at it going, what does it remind me of? Like what, what light beer is it reminding me of? And I'm not able to put my finger on it, which I think is really good. Right. It but should be the, its own thing, but that it looks like it's part of that category exactly. is part of that storytelling piece, right? Visually yeah. that we're like, oh, okay. Like, you know, in your brain, like it's giving those indications of if I'm looking for light beer, like this, this would work for me. Mm -hmm. Um that visually like you you get what we're trying you're picking up what we're trying to put down here exactly yeah no, i think and, and you know i think it also well not because my opinion counts or anything but i think that it might be an easier sale to the grocery store to give you shelf space because it looks like it belongs on the shelf well, thank you. Yeah, those are, that's actually, I mean, that's the kind of feedback that I love to hear because I know that like my team worked really hard on yeah, I mean, dialing this just, in and it was, I mean, it was months long process. Like that's another piece where, you know, uh, A-B testing and everybody, you know, is right. sharing opinions about, you know, changing this piece or changing that. Um, the number of just like really minute details that go into that piece. It's, it's an exceptional amount of work. Um, so I'm excited to hear that, you know, just gut shot. That's what it feels like, right. When you're yeah. looking at it, that's, that's what we're, that's the story we're trying to tell so that people will get excited and pick that up off the shelf. But it also doesn't. Okay. I, on one hand, I'm telling you it, it feels like it belongs on the, on the, on the shelf, in my opinion. And it looks like a light beer. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't, I'm not saying it will blend in and just be, it, it, it is, it has a distinctive look to it too. So it's like, it's, you've done both. You've, it's the Seattle Cider logo is pronounced on it. I like the, I like the green that you've chosen for the, like the stripes on the can. And I'll, in the show notes, I'll put a link to the image so that people go, you know, they can look at it if they want. Yeah. I just think it works. Thank you. So what's the APV on this? That one is, it's 4.2. I'm double checking. Okay. I have a can sitting in front of me. We did, um, these aren't the official, yeah, it's 4.2%. These aren't okay. the official cans we had to make. Um, I'm show, I'm showing you this. No one else yes, can see no, it. No one else can see it. <laughs> yeah, actually hold uh, that back up. Hold that back up again, please. Yeah. Okay. So these are our right. sample ones. These aren't the printed cans because we're going into printed cans, but we made um, sample cans and uh, so that we can send them out to people to try ahead of time and add some right. placements there. And yeah, so some people are going to be trying those soon. You will be trying this soon because I'm going to send some your way so you can taste it. I will, I will get and report back to you candidly too. Um, <laughs> I would expect nothing less at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. You figured out who I am. So let's, so that's new and that's on the horizon at the time we're recording this. What else might be coming? What you guys still looking at other combinations? I mean, you're always you're always innovating and testing, but anything anything new coming, you know, that you can talk about? We always have something new coming up. Um, there's okay. a couple things that we will have on the horizon that we can't really talk about just yet. Okay. Um, but I will let related? you. They are Apple related, yes. Okay. And I will let you know when we do. So if we need to have a follow up conversation about them, right. I'm absolutely game for that. Um, cool. one of the things, uh, and this is a, it's new every year and it's one of my favorite things to talk about, but we just released our annual city fruit cider. That is one that okay. does come in a bottle. It's one of our few. Okay. And that is one that sort of breaks the mold of other things where we actually do press those apples in house. So we do have an apple press. Um, it's okay. relatively small and, you know, we're only pressing, um, you know, a couple like bins of apples, it usually ends up being maybe like huh. one or two tons of apples. Um, but we work so with it, a local nonprofit and, and they give us the apples that they can't use. Um, otherwise the apples okay. go to food banks. Okay. And so where's that available at? 
So that one is available in our tasting room. Um, so in our Soto tasting room, the woods, you can mm -hmm. also get that one online. Um, you know, one of the things that we, that is nice about having like a winery license, we can ship to multiple states. So we ship to 39 different states. We're distributed okay. in like 15, um, and we can only ship to 39. Um, so that's, there's like, like I said earlier, there's a ton of regulations and we're abiding by them all. So someday if right. we're allowed to ship to additional states, we will. Um, and you can, you know, look that up at seattlesidercompany.com. We've got a cider finder for folks. Like if we do distribute to your state, you can put your uh, zip code in there and see where you can find our ciders and like how close they are to you. Um, otherwise, you can look and see if we can ship them to you if your state is one of the 39 that we ship to. Yeah, I'm looking... I'm looking in the, the, the city cider is not currently on the website. That one's not up there. Okay. It's currently there not. should be some details about that, both like, you know, on our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, um, because it's a little bit smaller. Although if you look on, I'll have to double check. I was going to say, if you look, are you looking on the shipping side? I am. Okay. Well, there we go. I guess I've got my work cut out for me after so I get I'm off sorry, of this I'm interview. You more work. Uh, no, that's okay. I'll make sure it's up there so that by the time people are listening to this podcast, uh, that they'll be oh, yeah. able to get that. But we will be doing, we actually had an off year where we didn't end up being able to do our city fruit release, which was 2020. And nobody is super shocked by that, I'm sure. Um, so we're doing two releases this year. We just did, um, we just did one in April. Uh, and then we're doing a second one for our anniversary in September. So okay. timing wise, that's kind of nice. It's around, you know, when harvest is starting. Um, it's one of our most, you know, quintessentially Seattle cider ciders uh, because all the apples are picked from Seattle proper. These are apples that are coming from, you know, people's fruit trees in their backyard, uh, public spaces that City Fruit is allowed to um, harvest from. It's a really great nonprofit organization. And, you know, they're teaching people about farming and agriculture. They're um, harvesting fruit that then goes to food banks or their CSAs. We take their okay. ugly apples or apples, you know, that aren't intended for feeding people like crab apples make mm -hmm. phenomenal cider, but nobody wants to eat them. Uh, so we take them. Okay. Yeah. And we've been making cider uh, with city fruit apples for, gosh, I want to say since 2015. Okay. So one, we'll, we'll, to wrap up the whole Seattle cider thing, let's talk about the woods. Okay. Um, because the idea that you're sitting in Soto and you're calling it the woods is kind of funny to me, but um, you have two, you have two trees growing there. So, I mean, I guess it is technically for the city. It's the woods. Yes. So when did the tap room open and give our audience kind of an overview of what they could expect if they were to go? Okay. Yeah. The current iteration opened in 2013 um, with the start of Seattle Cider. So it was, there was a lot happening um, where it was a build out of a new tasting room along with, you know, launching Seattle Cider. There were previous iterations of the, of the woods, which was the tasting room, you know, for the brewery um, mm -hmm. that was just in the brewery, but we expanded size when we were able to expand warehouse space. Um, it's, you know, it's got a really good atmosphere to it. Um, it's the woods because it's, you know, partly off the beaten path. Um, it, you kind of had to know where it was for a while. We really only first got a sign up that says the woods tasting room in 2020. That was a big deal. Okay. We've been working on that for a while. So like you had okay. to know where it was, you know, it was like the okay. secret escape. Um, it's yeah, it's got a very, um, it's a nice laid back atmosphere. Um, you know, it's lots of, lots of woods looking, you know, wood paneling and things. Um, okay. We've got, you know, games, like a little arcade space. We have over 30 taps. Um, we've got food from, uh, we have a little brick and mortar food spot that is also a commissary kitchen for some local food trucks. So Bread and Circuses does all the food. It's kind of, you know, upscale pub fare. It's very good. They make um, one of the best smash burgers I've had in a long time. I think I'm having that for lunch today. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, you know, we've got a patio. We um, also, actually, we could talk about this. We're working on we had built out some extra patio space, um, you know, in 2020 because people could only sit outside and, right. um, that 
was up for a good year and a half. And then mother nature had some other ideas. We had built it out with like pallets and we were using, you know, old wine barrels and things for tables. And, um, it was, you know, very on brand for like the look and feel. Um, we had a couple of pretty gnarly windstorms that took it down. So we're doing a new build out for that. That'll be coming, um, hopefully before it gets real warm out and give, you know, some additional seating outside. We do have patio space out there right now, but this just adds to kind of the outdoor seating, which is really nice. And it looks like, so you can rent the, the you can rent the space out for events, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, you, we do like rentals for like partial space. We do occasionally do like a full buyout, but in general, mm-hmm. um, you know, we want it to be open to customers who might be visiting from out of town and not know, you know, ahead of time. So we try not to like do a, a full close too often, but we've got a great mm-hmm. little mezzanine space. Um, we see people, you know, doing birthdays, retirement parties, um, engagement parties, bachelorette and bachelor parties up there. So you mm-hmm. kind of have like your own little space. Um, it's counter service. So it's super easy. Like if you're doing something that's, you know, work happy hour and you're like, oh, we're going to do a hosted tab or you're like, no, we're just all going to meet in this space and everybody does their own thing. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's really nice and laid back. Oh, one thing I will say that I love to talk about that's in our tasting room is we make cider slushies mm-hmm. and they're really yeah. good. <laughs> that's like, that's such a summer treat. We, um, we've been starting them earlier and earlier each year. Like in the winter, we do a mold cider. So you drink like a hot mold cider with like mulling spices. And mm-hmm. when it's cold and rainy and gray outside, like it's just kind of nice to like wrap your hands around like a it's warm like mug. June. Yeah. <laughs> no, by June, it's nice here. Um, I know. I, you're just trying to keep people out of Seattle, which is fine. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm just, yeah, exactly. You don't want them to know what a hidden gem it is or not right. so hidden gem. Right. But, I don't think Seattle has that problem. Everyone yeah. knows about Seattle. Everyone knows we've got good summers. So yeah, this year, as soon as we took the mold cider off we like plugged in the slushy machine and we're like all right it's go time um and so we change up that flavor every week um it's it's really good we have fun naming them and coming up with different combinations and flavors there so you know we're always trying to do something a little bit new and we do cider cocktails and things like that in the tasting room and yeah okay so i'm i'm reading something here and i'm confused hopefully you can clarify this for me is this going to be another thing i have to fix on our website (laughs) i don't think so okay good i'm confused okay so i'm looking at the part where um you know the rental information for the woods sure right and you've got you know children it's 21 plus so no kids there's a deposit blah 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 food there's this thing about decoration so i'm a little confused okay (laughs) it says no pins or nails are used to attach the items to the wall only blue tape yeah i understand that yeah all decorations are taken down and disposed of at the end of the event. I get that. Okay. This is the line I don't get. Absolutely no glitter, confetti, or open flames. None. <laughs> so I can't use glitter? I can't? No glitter. What? I'm just a little confused. No I just glitter. read that. I started laughing. I no like, glitter. Absolutely no glitter, confetti, or open flames. Period. Mm-hmm. None. Period. I love that. I think, I mean, that was actually pretty fun. I think it's pretty self explanatory. <laughs> Don't worry. So, listen, because of that, when I send you a box of ciders to try, I will not be using glitter as part of the packing material. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> that stuff is a nightmare. I mean, yeah, you, it, once it's, once it's in your space, it is there forever. I think, and I was thinking, know? like, if you're having a bachelorette party or a bachelor party, that the, the, the likelihood of something like that is just, Right, like those so, little like popping cannons of like glitter yeah, and things. Yeah. Like I mean, we're we trying to have fun, be, but we're yeah, we yeah. would be cleaning glitter out of like every surface for the rest of our days. So yeah, no glitter, no open flames. It is the woods, so I mean you have to be very careful about um, about burning and things like that. So we'll handle any open flames, which is pretty rare. There are very rarely any open flames. If there are, it's a problem. Um, exactly. Please let your bartender know <laughs> if there are open flames. They'll probably do you already have know. live music there regularly. We do. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. we started doing this a while back um, and then have been getting back into it. And so usually once or twice a month, um, we'll do live music. So we've got local artists, lots of like singer songwriters. Um, it's just a nice piece. We don't ever do a cover charge, so you can mm-hmm. just show up and enjoy, but we pay the artists nice. instead. So we pay the artists. You just get to come and enjoy ciders. Cool. And, uh, but yeah, it's, a, it's been a really nice way to, you know, we try to do a lot of things that involve um, 
supporting other local folks. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's bringing in local singer songwriters, local um, musicians to perform and, you know, share our space and, and get people excited about what they're doing. We also work with other local companies like um, The Works in Seattle. We sell some of their um, DIY kits. Uh, we yeah. will sell, you know, different, different products from other local folks because, you know, we want to, we're a local company in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to help support other local folks in the community and it's it's a really important part of like what we're doing and it's a nice space to be able to do that in our tasting room um because you know we're, we stay pretty busy so it's good visibility when we can we can bring in you know more people into mm -hmm. the fold so when you're not marketing cider mm -hmm. what do you like to do for fun uh i love to go see live music ah yes what was the last show you went to I just got back from the Beale Street Music Festival in Memphis. <laughs> but my last local show that I went to, I saw Valerie June, who actually is like from Memphis, um, at Showbox at the Market. And that was really okay. phenomenal. Hate to ask, but how was the Beale Street? It was amazing. Although I, it was really sure. amazing. I went all three days. Um, oh. I saw it was a really incredible lineup. Um, just, you know, a really great, like diverse number of acts to come out. Mm -hmm. um, I missed a couple of the folks that I went to see though, because there was a really gnarly rainstorm um, and they evacuated people briefly. And oh. we, my friend that I went with, we, we left and then got a message on, uh, the, on the festival app that said that those shows were in fact going to go on, but it was like well after the time that the concert normally would have ended. So mm -hmm. the show was over by like 1130, um, maybe okay. midnight tops. And, uh, two of the, the acts that I was there to see and like really excited about weren't starting until like 1245. I was already in my jammies. Like I was like, okay, that's not happening. We were home. We'd, you know, we'd already like yeah. had snacks and watched a show and we're like, oh, they are going back on. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was really good. It was a really, really good show. Memphis is fun. I will be back. Yeah. Memphis is fun. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's talk Seattle music scene though. Yes. Where do you like to see music in the Seattle area? Um, Showbox is great. Um, I particularly love, you know, Numos, Barbosa, Neptune. Um, I haven't been to the new crocodile space yet, so that's definitely on my list. Uh, I go see, you know, local shows. There's actually, so I live in West Seattle, um, and a friend of mine runs um, the local Barley and Vine, and they do uh, music every Wednesday, which also mm -hmm. like local singer songwriters. And so that's a much smaller venue, but like live music anytime, like. Right here obviously too like at the woods like i will see our shows as well so yeah i mean really any opportunity that i get to see live music i'm i'm pretty stoked on that and i will seek that out any local seattle musicians you want to give a shout out to oh our next like upcoming folks i'm trying to think that's a ah all right i'm going to fail on that question dylan and sarah yep thank you well here to help thank you <laughs> I didn't pull up our like website stuff because I would get distracted and I'd be like, I, looking well, you, at, like I, it's on the other monitor over here. So I'm always like, you know, looking over here, like you've, you know, okay. Do you drink coffee? I do. I live in okay. Seattle. I think it's a requirement, isn't it? Well, and you, and you did like the, the coffee cider. Okay. So I'm going to challenge you. Tell me a coffee shop in Seattle that I should try that I, I haven't tried. Oh, that's an easy one, actually. Um, oh. Fulcrum Coffee. So, I have tried Fulcrum. Yes. Um, Fulcrum has just the, it's gorgeous. Their space is gorgeous. Their brick and mortar coffee shop is like over in Westlake area. Mm -hmm. um, and they also, uh, fun fact, are our neighbors one door down from us uh, at the cidery. And I drink a lot of their coffee, not because I'm driving to Westlake all the time, um, but because they are roasting their coffee next door to us. And they provide all of the coffee that we have in our break room for our staff. And we drink an 
astronomical amount of coffee here. As you should. As, as we as should. should. Yeah, we gotta we gotta keep the cider makers and the packaging team and the bartenders. We keep everybody really well caffeinated um, right. with the highest quality coffee. And there we do. Go. We love the Fulcrum team. We've actually, um, you know, they'll come and have meetings like in our tasting room and, and bring folks That's by. Cool. We've um, hosted them for tours in the back and talk them through like the cider making process. And we have a nice. really great relationship with the folks over there and um, what they're doing like with their company is just phenomenal. So it's nice, right? Like that their coffee is delicious. So I'm going to want to drink it anyway. But then like the more you learn and kind of peel back the layers of like the story for Fulcrum, the more you would want to drink their coffee. They're just really, really great folks. Okay. Well, to wrap this up, this is, this is how I get away with everything. What didn't I ask you that I should have? Oh my gosh. That's a good question. I don't know. Should is hard, That's, right? Like, well, it's just you know, did, <laughs> did we did we unintentionally overlook something that we should bring up? No, we got to talk about light cider. We talked about our core lineup. You know, we talked about not your standard cider. All those fun things. I mean, there's always more to talk about. I could talk. About, I I mean, can and do talk about cider all day. That's my job, right? Sure. Um, but yeah. I, I think that okay. the one thing for me was that I um, missed the boat on sending you some samples ahead of time so that you could okay. taste through Sounds with good. me, um, even though, you know, we're, we started this in the morning. That's okay. I mean, sometimes. it's five o'clock somewhere. Yeah. yeah. The other thing actually, though, is that um, when we do like a lot of like our um, QA and QC, it's small mm-hmm. amounts when you're tasting it, but you actually want right. to do it earlier in the day, like when your palate is fresh, like not after right. lunch when you've, you know had onions on your salad or whatever, but. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Where can people find more about Seattle Cider online? Ah, yes. Um, You can find us at seattlecidercompany.com. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, sometimes on um, TikTok, occasionally on TikTok, and it's all at Seattle Cider Co. So lots of information to be found on there. We love, you know, talking about our products. We get to show off our staff and show you little peeks behind the scenes. We've been getting more into like doing video and fun things like that. So if you want to learn more about us, those are great places to check it out. All right. All right. We'll put those in the show notes where people can click on them. So thank you for taking the time to talk about cider with me today. I enjoyed myself and hopefully this was good for you. This was great. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate your time. All right. Take care. Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.